Can you think of one single advantage to getting an old IV bag, slitting it open, and putting the propofol bottle inside it, and using that as a suspension device? It's uh, befuddling to me because anyone picking up the bottle, as Mr. Walgren demonstrated, they would naturally gravitate towards just pulling the, the little hanger if that was your intent. Why would you go to all the hassle? And as I said, since it's just in a side slit, there's no mechanism for securing it there. It could easily slip out with any kind of movement or tugging on the IV. I mean, if you use a suspension device, it hangs it higher? Yes. Which is what you want? Correct. And if you want to infuse it with a background infusion of saline, yes, which is the normal approach. Can you speculate on a possible reason why a person would use it? Would, would get a knife and slip an IV bag and hang a propofol bottle by using that technique? I had never envisioned such a thing. Actually, when I read one of the expert reports suggesting that a bag was used, it was my impression that they were spiking the bottle through the bottom of the IV bag, and then they could adjust the height. But that doesn't work when, when I tried to repeat that simulation. So um, no, I can't conceive of a reason um, that anyone would go to that hassle to contrive a delivery system that really won't work. Well, the, 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 the other method of, of spiking the propofol bottle through the bottom of the IV bag, did you, did you try that out because there had been a claim by Albert, Alberto Alvarez that there was a propofol, uh, a, a white liquid inside the IV bag? Well, I read that. I wasn't sure whether it's referring to free liquid in the bag, which obviously isn't the case because there was no bag with any residual propofol in it. Um, and I think one of the experts also may have speculated that it was spiked in that fashion. But clearly it's not possible because the spike isn't lengthy enough to go through the bottom of the IV bag and then have enough residual spike to go into uh, the stopper uh, at the top of the bottle, even if it was sitting right beneath it, right above it. But in essence, your overall conclusion is there is no reason whatsoever to, su to use a, an IV bag as a suspension device, is there? No. It would, it, you could use it, as I said, by essentially turning the, the other infusion down to minimal amounts but it would be very cumbersome and very difficult and certainly would not be able to generate the nice smooth curve shown in this kinetic model. And have you ever seen this uh, abnormal uh, technique used to hang a, 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 a propofol bottle? No, I have not. Have you ever heard of it? I heard about it in court last week, but that's the first time. Now. Uh, there's, there's another way that you can give an infusion, isn't there? Well, there's several other ways. Um, Would one way be to spike the propofol bottle and empty it into the IV bag and then mix the propofol up? Yes, that's the way we did it in the early days, um, as I mentioned before pumps became available to allow us to give a more dilute concentration um, during surgery. So if you, if you took a, a full 100 milliliters of bottle there and put that into an IV bag and mixed it up, would this be what you considered a one-to-one a ratio of propofol to saline? Well, I don't know what you mean by one to one. If you took a 100 milliliter bottle of propofol, this contains 1,000 milligrams. So if you put it into a one liter bag, which is 1,000 milliliters, that makes a one milligram per milliliter concentration. So I think that's what you're referring to by one to one. And how would you mix this, this uh, propofol solution. 
How would you go about doing it? Well, do you want me to show you? Or I well, mean, I to, would. I, I hate to waste a bottle, just... but I would pull this tab off, and just as Dr. Schaefer demonstrated, uh, insert this spike in through the cork into the bottom, and then take this IV and you take a needle and you put the needle into this little side port here, and just let the let the bottle drain into this bag, and then we shake the bag like this, and then we let it run in, and it's a, a one milligram per mil. Um, you can also put two bottles in, make it two milligrams per mil, or in the case of the Chinese study, they put three bags, three bottles in for three milligrams per mil. And then once you get the uh, propofol in that bag, it's all mixed up, then what do you do to infuse the patient? Well, you would, you would either two ways. You could piggyback it, as I said earlier, which means putting another needle in a, in a system. Um, well, actually not. If you mix up the bag, you, yeah, you could either piggyback it into another IV, so you'd have a background uh, bag of just saline and a bag of dilute propofol, or you could just do what some practitioners do, which is just hook this IV directly up to the patient's IV catheter, uh, that isn't the way I normally do it. I use the two systems because that way if I need to turn it off, the patient can still get saline for hydration purposes. But you can do it with one system. Yeah. I mean, if, you're, if the patient has been adequately hydrated, you don't really need to worry about volume, and you're given a dilute concentration, yeah, you would just have the bag containing the propofol hanging and the end directly connected to their IV cannula, which is the little plastic tube that goes into the vein. Now, if you did it that way, yes. Uh, what evidence would you expect to be in existence that demonstrated that you did it that way? Well, obviously, the first thing is you'd have a bag that contained propofol, and I could fill this bag and show you, but it would be that same white, milky residual, and even when it's empty, I think I have an empty bag. Oh, I guess I have it in my other bag. But you can see there's lots of uh, liquid that still remains in the bag, and certainly the residual of propofol, because of the nature of its lipid properties, does have some effect on the bag. So it's pretty obvious the difference between a bag that's had saline and one that's had propofol in it. And I believe the bag that was allegedly used to hang the bottle had no evidence of propofol in it. Do you want me to show uh, an empty bag of saline or no? Uh, it's no, that's, uh, that's not necessary. Uh, so you'd expect there to be a bag with a residual of propofol in it. Right, and of course you'd have a chamber where because you're dripping that white milky stuff that's, you can see this is what would be left. Uh, but it would be throughout the entire distribution of the infusion set. It wouldn't just be, as was found at the crime scene, in the very distal part of the uh, delivery system. So from the answer, me, from the answer, the court will strike the word crime. Oh, excuse That's me. That's deleted at the scene. Thank so, you. I apologize. So you'd expect there to be res residual in the IV bag. You'd also expect to be a residual in the chamber and in the IV line. Yes, sir. Now, the evidence that was seized this at, at, at this scene, there was no IV bag with any propofol, correct? Correct. No IV line with any propofol in it, correct? I think the evidence... Just a moment. Overruled. You may answer. Sorry. Um, I understood that there was propofol found in the distal part of the line. Okay, but not in the but upper not, part. Not above the side port. So that would be consistent with the propofol being delivered by use of a syringe? Correct. Uh, so informing your opinion on infusion, when you see that there's no propofol in any delivery device other than the distal end of the IV line, there's no deployment of the strap used to hang the, the propofol bottle, does that cause you to think that there's no evidence of an infusion? Exactly. 
Now, I want you to take a look at Dr. Schaefer's. But I would add that's not the only evidence. What, what other evidence? I think you're going to show some. I, I just want to state that there are other reasons that I question as well. Okay. Well, I'd like you to refer to the, uh, the diagram that Dr. Dr. Schaefer did showing, I believe that's an infusion between the hours of, I think that's 9 a.m. to 12. That would be noon. Now, that diagram, you see where at, at 12 o'clock the, well, first of all, on the upside, you got the, propof the blood level and the, uh, the brain level going up very close to each other? Yeah. Normally, the blood level goes up significantly faster, and there is a slight difference. This is a, a compressed scale being three hours, so... Um, but there's usually a, a lag between the blood going up and the brain concentration going up. Well, look at where it's going down, though, at 12 o'clock. Yes. Now, we know that the 100 milliliter bottle, this is S, 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 S. Quadruple S. The 100 milliliter propofol bottle that you have is empty. Correct? Yes. It had a spike mark in it and it's empty. To do this scenario of infusion, does this assume a, any kind of coincidence? I'm not sure what you mean by coincidence, but I guess it assumes that the patient died. Um, to it at exactly the end of the infusion, right? I mean, at exactly the same time that the bottle became empty, the patient dies. That's what it says to me. Yes, and I well, think that's what Dr. Schaefer suggests. Based upon that diagram, where you've got the patient approaching levels uh, at. I guess it's about ten o'clock, where it says responsive only to painful stimulus. Is there anything that, if it didn't cause the patient to die at 10, that would cause him to die at 12? Nothing that I can imagine. I mean, In this, this scenario never gets to a high level like 6 or 4, does it? No, and in fact, I would just comment that having done thousands of cases of using infusions like this for sedation during local anesthesia and during procedures, Patients who are breathing spontaneously, there would be no reason for them to stop breathing uh, if you're giving this continuously. Uh, in fact, the, the infusion rate, I actually calculated what the average infusion rate would be if you gave the entire 1,000 milligrams over three hours. And it's precisely uh, in the concentration range that's recommended in the package insert for propofol. It's just slightly higher. It's, it's 89 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And the package insert suggests the range of 25 to 75. But as a practitioner, I will tell you, we commonly give 90 mics per kilogram per minute for conscious sedation in the operating room. Now, the, the, the level between 10 o'clock and 12 o'clock, very, very uh, little change, isn't there? Right. Is there any change there that would cause a change in condition of the patient? None that I can imagine. I mean, a patient typically in the operating room with that kind of infusion and the um, modeled blood concentrations would be sleeping, would be sleepy but arousable in most cases, uh, but breathing spontaneously. Um, and there's, there would be no reason that they would suddenly, um, I guess he could hypothesize that he's coughed, developed laryngospasm suddenly just at the end of the infusion, which would require an, an incredible coincidence of circumstances. I mean, if he died before the end of the infusion, say on that chart at, say, 10.30, 11, would the, the, would the infusion continue to go? I don't believe so. I mean, the circulation stops. What's, I mean, the, the, the drug... Um, 
would build up, I guess, in the vein till the pressure, you know, I, I've never done any experiments in, in dead people, but um, I can't imagine it would run very long. And the other thing is inconsistent is if he was running this concentration through a distal vein, that is a small vein in the back of the knee, it's going to drain into the leg and into the femoral vein. And the femoral vein is where they measure the concentration. So I would expect that if in fact he was getting this high concentration, undiluted propofol, that the concentration in the femoral vein would have been higher. But again, that depends on which femoral vein the coroner used for the sample, and I couldn't find that information. But if the blood is not circulating, and you've got an infusion going, the blood's not circulating, does that create a reverse pressure that stops the uh, infusion? I would imagine it would, yes. Now, I've got another diagram I'd like to show you. I'm going to mark this quadruple T. No, uniform. Unicorn. Uniform. Uniform. U. Okay. Now, once again, this is a, another diagram that you have prepared? Uh, no, no, it was prepared for me at my request uh, by Dr. Gabriella Mellon Ornelas. Uh, what, is, what does this depict? This uh, two-part diagram on the upper panel shows the propofol concentration in micrograms per milliliter. When you infuse 1,000 milligrams, that is the entire bottle here, uh, over a period of 180 minutes and achieve uh, a similar uh, blood level profile to that reported uh, in Dr. Schaefer's simulation and demonstrating a very similar decline after, at the end of the infusion. But in addition, and more importantly, what it illustrates in the lower panel is the elimination of unchanged propofol. Now, you all know that propofol is extensively metabolized, but there is a percentage of propofol that is eliminated in the urine in an unchanged form. And at autopsy, they determined that the level of unchanged propofol in the urine was extremely low. In fact, on this scale, which is a somewhat expanded scale so that we could show um, what would actually be expected based on the amount of propofol that was given with this model and the amount of metabolism and elimination that would, re that would uh, result. Uh, this shows the uh, unchanged urinary concentration of propofol. Now, that, that, that's the, the, the dotted line at the bottom. The dotted line at the bottom is the level of unchanged propofol that was reported at autopsy by the coroner. And the red line in the middle, what is that? That would be, again, the average concentration of unchanged propofol that was eliminated starting here at 9 a.m., very little, but accumulating over time to 12 a.m. This is significant because at autopsy there was 550 mLs, about a half a liter of urine in Mr. Jackson's bladder. That contained this a very low concentration of propofol, not the amount shown on this slide, which would approach actually 2 milligrams of propofol. Now, there's on that red solid line, there's a couple dotted lines on each side of it. Could you explain what those are? Well, these are just the uncertainty limits. These are just, um, Dr. Schaefer talked about two standard deviations above and below. It just accounts for the variability that I've been discussing with you in the last couple of days. So it, it could vary anywhere within this range. We're just giving you kind of an idea. But in, in no way does it come close to the level reported uh, by the coroner at autopsy. Even in the extreme situation when you would have maybe poor renal perfusion or um, 
some other reason for having low elimination of free propofol, the level uh, would still be far in excess of the level reported at autopsy if Mr. Jackson had received 1,000 milligrams of propofol during the three hours prior to his death. So you can kind of confirm and negate the three-hour infusion of the 1,000 milligrams by looking at the metabolism that occurs in the urine. Is that correct? Not the metabolite. This is unchanged propofol, free propofol, not the metabolite. So a small percentage of propofol is eliminated in the urine um, as unchanged propofol. The majority is the propofol metabolite. So, and this just looks at the free or unchanged propofol. And so in the event that the, the infusion were done as, as it's described by Dr. Schaefer, you would expect a urine concentration of, of unchanged propofol at the level of two, plus or minus the deviations that are depicted by the dotted line. Correct. Plus or minus one, so it would be a range of one to three. So it's totally inconsistent with the level of urine in the urine that was obtained by way of analysis at autopsy. Correct. I've got another diagram I'd like to label as quadruple V. Victor, yes. Dr. White, we got quadruple V up there. Would you explain what that diagram shows? Well, this diagram basically summarizes the scenario that we propose took place on the morning of the 25th. On the upper panel is the propofol concentration in micrograms per milliliter. Here at around 1040 or 1045, a 25 milligram bolus injection of propofol and 25 milligrams of lidocaine was infused slowly through that distal side port as I demonstrated earlier. And we would result um, using the Schaefer model in the following curve, which we actually uh, used Dr. Schaefer's simulation. And then if just prior to Sometime prior to noon, Mr. Jackson had self-administered an additional 25 milligrams of uh, propofol with 25 milligrams of lidocaine. It would jet very rapidly, which is the way most uh, individuals uh, inject propofol, unless you're doing it intentionally very slowly. It's hard to actually do it that slowly. Um, and it would result in this peak concentration and more importantly, if we look at the unchanged propofol, and I think this is very, very significant in this case, uh, this is unchanged propofol in milligrams in the urine uh, as a function of time in this simulation. Um, and I will tell you the scale is vastly expanded because the concentration at autopsy was low. So you can see this is 0 0.05, 0 0.1 uh, milligrams um, of drug. It's not a concentration, actually. It's an absolute amount. So the expansion of the scale it makes on, it, on, the, yeah. on the side axis accounts for the dotted line reflecting the amount in the urine at autopsy being in the middle as opposed to the bottom. Yeah, it's in the middle. It's, it's actually above what you would have expected um, based on the fact that Mr. Jackson only received 25 milligram bolus earlier by Dr. Murray it would be, as you can see down here, about 0 0.05 or slightly less. But with the administration of the additional 25 milligrams that we're speculating was self-injected by Mr. Jackson, you can see that actually the urinary level of free propofol increases rapidly and uh, at the time of death would actually be almost identical to the value found in the urine at autopsy. As a result of these two descriptions, I'm talking 
about VV, which is the bolus injection just before 12, and UU, which is Dr. Schaefer's infusion scenario. Which of those scenarios is the more reasonable to you? Well, you're asking someone who's biased, of course, but I cannot understand how it's possible that he got a three-hour infusion when the evidence didn't show the infusion setup and the fact that the elimination of the drug in the urine is completely inconsistent um, with the amount of propofol that would have been administered had Mr. Jackson received this entire bottle of propofol, as, dis as suggested by Dr. Schaefer. So you think it was a self-injection of propofol near the hour of between 11.30 and 12 o'clock that they did it? In my opinion, yes. The uh, that first uh, slow bolus? Uh, when would the effects wear off? How, 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 well, how long would that have an effect on Mr. Jackson if it was an effect just by from propofol and the low amounts of uh, the razepam that Dr. Murray well, thought was there? Well, it would depend on the effect you're talking about. If you're talking about reduction in anxiety, the studies would suggest it could last for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about sedation, or uh, any other particular effect of the drug on the central nervous system or the brain, it would probably be uh, 10 to 15 minutes maximum. Of course, I'm assuming in, in giving you those times that there was not other centrally active drugs present, and we know for a fact that isn't the case because there, were lorazo, there was lorazepam in a high concentration. There was also a small amount of midazolam present. So uh, you, I, I, just to clarify my answer, I was referring to simply giving propofol alone, not as part of a, quote, polypharmacy. Okay, last. Dr. Schaefer said his scenario reconcile with all the facts in this case. I want you to tell, does it reconcile with Dr. Murray's statement? No. Does it reconcile with the physical evidence found at the scene? No. Does it reconcile with the urine concentration found at autopsy? No. The scenario that we have up here does it reconcile with Dr. Murray's statement to the police? It does with respect to the uh, dose that Dr. Murray administered. I don't recall if he commented on the possibility that Mr. Jackson itself administered. So I, I have to carefully check that report. Does it but in other respects, it does, yes. Does it reconcile with the evidence found at the scene? Yes, it does. Does it reconcile with the urine evidence provided by your reconciliation? Yes. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Mr. Flanagan, thank you. May I see counsel, please?
And, and Dr. White, thank you. What we're going to do is we're going to ask you to step down, and I'm going to order you to come back at 9 o'clock a.m. Monday morning without any further order, notice, subpoena. Of course, remember and please follow all the admonitions about not discussing your testimony or any other aspects of the case with any other witnesses until we finish the trial, and you may step down. What I'd like you to do, if you wouldn't mind, is you can step down right now and just uh, have a seat behind counsel, and then you'll be able to come and retrieve the uh, materials. Yeah, if you could move the bottle. In the Right. Uh, let's uh, let's have the let's Mr. Flanagan. Let's. I don't know what we did with that. That's thirty. So we need to have thirty put back into uh, the envelope, which Mr. Flanagan and Dr. White are doing. All right, sir. Thank you. And you can retrieve those matters in just a little bit. Well, you know what I'm going to tell you right now, anyway, ladies and gentlemen. No big surprise. Uh, with the uh, agreement of the parties and, in fact, at their suggestion and urging and with my agreement as well, uh, this is an appropriate time for us to stop before a cross-examination. Uh, we still have some uh, other a uh, aspects of the case we have to discuss. So uh, let me deliver to you these important admonishments and instructions. Of course, it's a weekend, so You'll have the whole weekend to ponder the significance of your responsibilities. Please do not discuss among yourselves or with anyone else any aspects of this case, the testimony, the evidence, the uh, parties, etc. Don't form or express any opinions about the case until it's submitted finally to you. Don't visit any scene or location that may have been referenced, mentioned, or involved in the case. Don't perform any experiments. And on your own or through another person, don't conduct any independent research or investigation on any topics, subjects, or persons mentioned or involved in this case. This means not viewing, listening to, or reading anything about this case, including anything on any television or radio program, uh, newspaper or magazine articles, or books. Have no contact whatsoever with any Internet websites that concern any topics or subjects mentioned or involved in this case, including but not limited to any search engine sites such as Google, Ask, or Bing, or social network sites, including but not limited to Facebook or MySpace. Nor should you text or tweet or access any blogs or post any messages on any sites regarding any of these topics, subjects, or persons. If anyone tries to communicate with you regarding any of these matters, approaches you, starts in a conversation about any matters, immediately cease any such communication or contact and notify the court staff. Once again, as I've said repeatedly, and I'm sure you understand, this case will be tried based upon the evidence presented in this courtroom. It will not be tried upon anything else uh, outside there in the universe. And I see so many of you are shaking your heads that you clearly understand these uh, responsibilities. Don't have any contact or communication with the defendant, the attorneys, the witnesses, or spectators as well. Do all of you continue to assure me that you will follow unhesitatingly the written admonishments as well as my continuing verbal admonishments? All indicating the affirmative. Please enjoy lunch, uh, excellent Chinese food, and we do have plenty of vegetarian choices as well. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to ask that you join us at 9 o'clock a.m. this coming Monday morning. We are past, and certainly you know it, and I do it as well. The uh, date, I told you uh, uh, your services would be over, but I know uh, all of you understand uh, that things happen in cases, and uh, I, I, I really do thank you so much for your continued uh, dedication to this case, and I recognize the sacrifices you're making. So please continue to hang in there and uh, enjoy your weekend, uh, and we'll see you at 9 o'clock a.m. this coming Monday morning. Have a good one. Good day, good night, good weekend.